1955, the Sutton family would experience a real-life nightmare when strange alien beings began terrorizing their property. Desperate and unsure of where to turn for help, they had to fight these beings off their own property. But before we get into tonight's episode, be sure to go ahead and slap that like button and subscribe button because I release storytelling of the mysterious and supernatural. Make sure to stay till the end of the video for the Sutton family nightmare. Now, when it comes to the supernatural, Kentucky has it all. A history steeped in mystery and legend and its fair share of unexplained phenomena, and it really makes the bluegrass state a hotbed for the paranormal. From ghosts and witches to UFOs and Bigfoot, there really seems to be no end to the strange sightings and encounters that have been reported here. So, what is it that makes Kentucky so fascinating with the paranormal? Perhaps it's the state's long and storied history. With a past that includes Native American tribes, pioneer settlers, and the Civil War, plenty of stories and legends are to be told. Or maybe it's simply because Kentucky is home to some of the country's most beautiful and eerie landscapes. But no matter the reason, one thing is for sure. If you're looking for a supernatural experience, Kentucky is one of the many places to be. Kentucky is home to these mysterious mounds. These mounds are believed to have been created by the Native Americans to bury their dead. However, recent discoveries have shown this may not be the case. The earthworks have been attributed to a culture known as the Adenas, or Mound Builders. These mounds have been the subject of much debate and mystery, with some believing that they actually have a connection to the extraterrestrial visitors. Kentucky is home to many of these mounds, and the Adena people are thought to be responsible for their construction. The Adena was a tall, thin person with a large head and advanced engineering skills. They were able to tame the wilderness and create beautiful works of art. But it's speculated that only half of the mounds were actually used to bury the dead, the Adena dead. The other half, researchers are not sure. They conjecture that the mounds had different purposes, but they don't know. A man by the name of Robert Silverberg said that the Andina folk were usually tall with a significant physical appearance. He stated that it would appear that a group of people, different in many ways, came into the Ohio Valley from around 1000 BC. Is it possible that these ancient people were aliens? In Kentucky, there are more burial and effigy mounds than in any other state. These enigmatic earthworks may hold clues about the Adena people who left no artifacts of their everyday lives. Investigators can help identify these people, who they were and where they came from, and their lives. But we have no idea what these people were truly like. While details surrounding these people remain largely a mystery, much is still to be learned about this ancient culture. Studying their burial practices may offer some clues for investigators interested in uncovering more about these kinds of people. As the Adena people disappeared as suddenly as they had appeared, investigating their burial practices could provide insight into what happened to this ancient culture. So, after the Slack Farm incident in Union County, Kentucky in 1989, new laws were put into place, making it a felony to try and expose what is inside these burial sites. However, this was not always the case. For years, people from all walks of life have been looting these mounds for the lucrative black market artifact trade or because they are impressed by the craftsmanship of the artifacts. Archaeologists are interested in these mounds because they offer a chance to learn about the Adena people, who left no artifacts of their everyday lives. By studying the burial practices of the Adena, investigators may be able to uncover clues about what had happened to this ancient culture. These mounds have been the subject of much debate and mystery, with some believing that they have a connection with the extraterrestrial visitors in Kentucky. One of the more intriguing aspects of the Kentucky mounds is that there seems to be a plethora of cryptid sightings and encounters. Perhaps these mysterious mounds just seem to be a lightning rod for the supernatural. For whatever reason, it appears that there are several eyewitness encounter dogman stories that all revolve around these mysterious beings protecting or patrolling burial mounds. This is not Kentucky exclusive, nor is it burial mound exclusive, but there does seem to be an uncanny connection between the two. A woman by the name of Janice Stanton had an encounter with a dogman back in 1978 on the far back side of her property. 
She had just finished making dinner and was heading out to tend her horses in the evening when she noticed they seemed extremely spooked by something. In trying to calm them down, they began going crazy, and that's when this large, upright wolf had begun to step out of the woodline, directly in her direction. Frightened by what she saw, she ran back to her house to grab the shotgun when this thing began to chase after her. She made it back to the house, and this creature almost managed to get her. Angry and determined to get her, it actually broke its hand through her window, trying to grab her, and her husband pumped a few shotgun shells into it, which seemed to deter it for the time being. Obviously, in this situation, police had been called out, but nothing could be determined from the ordeal. Although Mrs. Stanton was in hysterics and stuck, the police were dumbfounded by what she said. According to the evidence at the scene, nothing would indicate any proof of a bipedal wolf creature, as she had stated. It appeared as if somebody had just tried to break in. And after realizing the police were no help, she continued to have violent run-ins with the same set of creatures that seemed to dwell on the backside of her property in a more rural Kentucky. Later in life, she would learn that the entire area used to be native territory and featured several burial mounds, as so she was told. Janice's story is not a public one and was personally shared with me by a close family member. After she was humiliated and threatened by police, other family, and friends for what she had claimed had nearly attacked her, she doesn't often speak her story. She and her husband don't live in Kentucky anymore, but I can't help but think that there has to be some connection with the supernatural in these bizarre mounds. Perhaps they act as a gateway, potentially allowing us to see the other side, or maybe it gets much darker. Maybe these mounds go down into the ground, into tunnels and caverns where horrific beasts and monsters lie. One thing is for sure, nobody knows the truth of what these mounds hold. And it wasn't long. Around 10 mounds in Henderson County had attracted attention. This is right near the Ohio River. An excavator was called in, digging in two out of the 10 mounds. And sure enough, the mounds did hold a secret. Within them were the remains of a pre-native culture. Strange artifacts and objects were discovered being made of glass. Artifacts and things that seemed to even predate the natives. The owner of the property, an A.J. Anderson, claimed that the trinkets were actually impressively carved and existed a long time ago. It was hard for him to believe what he saw was real. But after doing more research on the topic, he realized that these mounds were much older than he had first thought, and that an unknown civilization had actually created the objects. AJ's story is widely available because he was pretty open about his findings. The real question is, what ancient culture or society existed before the Native Americans? They were advanced, but where did they go? And why have they mysteriously vanished? Or are they underground in these mounds that could potentially give us more clues? A Colonel A.H. Majors also discovered mounds on his property in Henderson County. Like AJ, he also found ancient artifacts and trinkets that, too, predated a Native American tribes. However, there seems to be no evidence of any skeletal remains inside the mounds, as initially suspected. If there are burial mounds, is it possible that they are only burial mounds for artifacts and not for bodies, perhaps cursed objects even? Author and field researcher Barton M. Noonally had the chance to see some of these artifacts firsthand. Well, they did not appear as intricately carved, but they did appear to be genuine. What's interesting is that the glass was unavailable to many early cultures and did not appear to be tools constructed by Native Americans. Barton said that these mounds and instruments were more than likely built by several different peoples that are entirely unrelated. Not just one culture, but several. This is large because practically every aspect of this race remains a mystery to this day. They were a distinct people, that's for sure but they did not adhere to the share of traditions of their prehistoric counterparts. They did not cremate or bury their deceased in mounds, but rather in shallow graves marked by large stones and heel stones. The corpse is interred between two giant rocks that are positioned upright or standing. To this day, very little is known about this ancient race. In contrast to similar burial sites discovered in adjacent states, no artifacts, not even a single thread of clothing have ever been found concerning Kentucky's remains. In addition to what they found in these stone graves, the bones were smaller than contemporary natives, and fewer than 10 stone grave burials have been discovered at all. At the same time, the earthworks of the mound builders cover a vast region, 
Each one is located in northern Kentucky. Pre-native cultures have been found in North America, but their existence is not yet recognized by mainstream archaeology. There is still much to be learned about these cultures, but investigators might be able to find more clues by looking into commonly held scientific facts about the last great ice age. Is it possible that the ice age had created a land bridge of ice between Asia and the Americas, which would explain how pre-native cultures could have ended up in North America? By further investigating this theory, we may gain a better understanding of pre-native cultures in North America. There are many theories about how the first people got to North America, but one thing is for sure. They walked across a land bridge from Siberia to Alaska. This was back when the ice caps were melting and the ocean levels were lower. So, as the climate got warmer and the ice caps began to melt again, the ocean levels supposedly rose and flooded the land bridge, trapping anyone on the other side. We know that these people were intrepid explorers willing to journey thousands of miles across an unknown territory in search of new lands. And we also see that they were successful in their travels, as the Native Americans are living proof of that. August 21st, 1955, a quaint Kentucky family was residing in the little farmhouse when the impossible happened. A UFO craft of some kind had flown directly over the house, and later on, what they described as little green men would come to terrorize the property. They got so bad that it was to the point where all of them fled to the police station for help. This event is now known as the Kelly Hopkinsville encounter. What's impressive is just how viral this encounter went and how it became the direct inspiration for films like E.T. by Steven Spielberg, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, Critters, and many other Hollywood films. It is so popular that the town even has an annual festival called the Kelly Little Green Men Day Festival. Multiple conspiracy theories coincide with a summer eclipse happening that is supposed to be the result of another alien encounter. However, no additional meeting has occurred since that fateful day in 1955. Now, at about 10.30 p.m. on Sunday, August 21st, 1955, a man by the name of Elmer, who went by the nickname Lucky, a relatively young man in his 20s, was visiting his mother and three younger half-siblings at their farmhouse. This took place about eight miles north of Hopkinsville. Elmer was accompanied by his wife, Vera, and their friends, his brother, JC, and sister-in-law, as well as a family friend. Quite a small party at the house. After their mother had graciously prepared a big supper, the giant party sat down to finally play a card game and ready to relax. However... This is right when Elmer's friend, Billy Ray, said something that would shake everybody. As he was walking back into the house after coming from the well to get some water, he had told everyone he had just seen a large, round, metallic object. He even mentioned how it had rainbow-colored streaks trailing behind it, moving quickly in the sky. Everybody responded like you would expect. They laughed at him, thinking he was either out of his mind or this was some elaborate prank. They thought it was just another one of his tricks, since he was a known trickster. However, Billy Ray seemed genuinely concerned and bothered. He wore an expression of stress and worry on his face. They then informed him that this was likely a meteor or a shooting star, and did not worry. Unfortunately for him, he had sought assurance from his wife that she believed him, but instead, she laughed at him. Frustrated, Billy Ray wanted to prove that what he saw was real. So, after enough talking... He got Elmer to get up with him and go out to the well to point out exactly in the sky where he had seen this thing. However, Elmer was not too sure on what to make of his story. He could tell that Billy Ray was definitely shooken up and scared, but not sure what to make of everything. So, after some time, they decided to go back into the house and continue their card game. As they turned around and were returning home, both men stopped in their tracks. This is when they both saw this strange glowing object coming closer to the house from the woods behind them. As it became close enough to where they can make out details, they realized that a creature was what they were looking at. A human-like creature specifically. Large eyes, two legs, seeming to levitate in the air with its arms raised as if in surrender. Both men were terrified, running inside the house and slamming the door behind them. Now, Elmer's mother, Glennie, had no idea what had gotten into the two men or why they were so petrified. Preparing for the worst, she sent Elmer's youngest siblings up to bed so they wouldn't be scared. She did not understand what this was all about, though. 
since she had lived here for decades without anything weird going on. She began to suspect this was still some elaborate, well-thought-out prank, and now Elmer was in on it. Both Billy Ray and Elmer began to grab the 12-gauge shotgun and the 22 rifles, panicking, standing guard at the door. Still suspicious, she thought they were taking this prank way too far. Upset, she presses Billy for answers and wanted to know why they were doing this. Why were they taking this prank so far? And he just looked at her and told her he hoped she did not have to find out. From there, they sat there waiting silently. And that's right when a figure, about three feet tall, appeared in the doorway from the darkness. Their mother, Glennie, screamed in terror, and in response, everyone came running to see what the matter was. Billy fired at this figure and pierced a hole in the screen door. Out of curiosity or baby stupidity, perhaps both, Billy steps out on the front porch when a hand supposedly reaches down, a clawed one, grazing his hair gently. Billy Ray is grabbed and pulled back into the house for his own safety. So Elmer steps outside, aimed the gun directly at the roof, and fired. And whatever he shot at apparently rolled off the roof and disappeared into the woods completely unharmed. And just then, a pair of glowing red eyes and large talons appeared at the window in the living room. Billy Ray shot at it with a 12-gauge shotgun. The creature almost did a backflip and took off. And Glennie did the only thing she knew how to do. Pray. She was a devout Christian woman who had just been to church earlier that Sunday. She was convinced that these creatures, whatever they were, had been spawns of the pit of hell. Amidst all the chaos, her youngest children had now been awakened from all the commotion and gunshots and were now coming to her for answers. They were scared, and Elmer demanded that she and the young ones go back to the room and hide. She refused, although everybody else listened. Elmer and Billy Ray went out to the front yard while the other party stayed inside. The two men in the front were alerted to something up in the maple tree. Everybody could see one of these green little men perched on a branch directly above them. They tried to shoot at it, but as they did, clearly hitting it, it just floated off into nothing. Something interesting that was noted is when these shots hit these beings, they recoiled. The sound of bullets hitting metal. It wasn't long before everybody realized the bullets were pointless against their mysterious assailants. This caused them to retreat in terror. They all went back into the house, locking the doors, panicking, unsure of how to proceed to protect the family. They began asking questions. What are these things? They weren't sure if they were dealing with entities of another dimension, demons perhaps. Well, it's not exactly documented who said this. Somebody had mentioned that bright light seems to hurt their large yellow pupils. Whenever a light comes on, these beings fled. They took that information and ran with it literally. They turned on every light in the house frantically and sat there silently waiting. They then heard scratching from the roof and the sounds of the younger children beginning to cry. Elmer once again runs outside aiming his gun at the roof, firing again at the creature there. And just like before, the creature floats down out of sight, completely desperate and realizing their attempts were futile, they decided now, after everybody piles into the trucks and retreats to the Hopkinsville police station, you could imagine the face of the officers who 11 terrified individuals greeted right before midnight. They told the officers they had been fighting little silver men for hours. While what they had said was not taken seriously at first, it was evident to everybody that there were these 11 people who were incredibly shaken up and scared by something. Then, the officer dealing with them decided to call Chief Russell Greenwell. The latter had radioed Kentucky State Police the Christian County Sheriff's Office, and the Fort Campbell Army Base, all dispatching personnel of their own. The local newspaper quickly got wind of this and even sent one of their own photographers. And like a modern media frenzy, at least half a dozen law enforcement and media members were trying to get as much information out of this family as they possibly could. The property was thoroughly searched and the family was questioned. Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on which way you look at it, no signs of these strange little goblin men had been found. However, none of this was a dream. Holes in the screen and plenty of shotgun shell casings were found. One of the officers even mentioned something glowing in the woods, but when he searched, he could find nothing. Even the ground beneath where Elmer had shot one of these goblin men appeared to have this strange iridescent sheen when looked at from an angle. Unsure of how to move forward, officers began to individually question family members. However, 
They would later discover that all 11 people corroborated the same story down to the most minute detail. Now, supposedly, after the family had tried to sleep at around 3.30 in the morning, they were awakened by the sight of a little green man on the other side of their bedroom window. Billy Ray and Elmer decided to spend the next hours on guard until sunrise. It seems that these creatures remained hidden on the property when the authorities were there and were now back in full swing after everything had died down. The beast seemed to disappear entirely just before daybreak. Fortunately for this family, this is the last they would ever see of them. About 14 or so years later, a couple of UFO researchers and writers had approached Elmer to finally tell his side of the story and make it more public. He had agreed to it. However, there was repercussions. People began to treat him differently once his story was in public eye. People mocked him and made fun of him, killing his ego and traumatizing him. Out of those 11 people who experienced the strange events of this day, they all too remained traumatized and afraid to speak about the event. There seems to be a very harsh backlash on anybody with a supernatural experience for whatever reason. It's regrettable that society is not more open-minded and instead should treat these situations as a what if, or if anything, at least listen to what they have to say, whether they agree with it or not. I think it's a psychological defense mechanism. Denial and mockery is the easiest way to dismiss something we are terrified of. Now, I can't say that the story happened and this may be some giant conspiracy to make up a fake case. However, the details are fascinating and knowing what I do, I wouldn't be surprised if this encounter turned out to be the actual truth. What questions do we ask ourselves to truly understand this case? Especially in this time frame where people did not talk about these things openly. What did these 11 individuals have to gain? And what was their incentive? Fame? The only fame you would be getting at this time is your reputation on the line. That is if it makes any sense. So maybe they were attacked by owls or something. Indeed, what they went through can be explained away though, right? Well, if there's anything I've learned in my life is that not everything is 100% explainable. And I think that's just life. No matter how much people want to group everything into something explainable. What I also find interesting is the family's neighbor who was about a quarter mile up the road north of them. He had heard the gunshots going off and saw the lights going off in the woods. He was under the suspicion that the family had a loose pig and they were trying to look for it, and that the gunshots were them going after bobcats who were attacking livestock. And what about all the police officers who were on this investigation but found nothing? These men had a chance to talk to the eyewitnesses firsthand and could see on their face the absolute terror in their eyes as they recalled the same story from 11 different people. How can a story be so well corroborated between 11 eyewitnesses? Are you telling me that these simple country folk were masterclass actors and just came up with a detailed fake account for fun? It doesn't make a lot of sense, nor does it seem plausible. This is more and more evident to me the more I dig into this case due to the mental decline of Elmer. He began to feel as if he was psychologically declining and could not hold a job anymore. Even his mother had decided to sell the farmhouse and move to an apartment in town because she felt safer around people. And the descriptions of the creatures from all 11 people matched up perfectly. The height, the upper body, the atrophied legs, the pointed ears, and the glowing eyes. All were 100% consistent. Surely this was a fabricated tale. I mean, there would have been at least one slip up here, right? Well, Dr. J. Allen Hynek an astronomer and highly regarded UFO researcher for the U.S. Air Force Base, declared the case completely preposterous and an insult to common sense. This was found in the 2008 World of UFOs by Chris Rutkowski. However, is it possible he was saying that as a cover-up to the truth since many do that kind of thing on public record? Other skeptics have chimed in and claimed that the little men were actually monkeys from the carnival that were brought and great horned owls had attacked the family. Moonshine was also often suggested as the reason behind the encounter, but family members have claimed that can't be. Glenny, the mother, refused to allow any alcohol on the property or cursing. They were a very trustworthy, no-nonsense kind of family. They kept to themselves and did their own thing. Fabricating something to this scale seemed so out of character. And yet, Dr. J. Allen Hynek, regardless of what's evident here about the case, I'll leave that up to you to believe. So, what do you think? Was this story just a simple misidentification of monkeys and owls, or perhaps the family got tired of the quiet country life 
and desire to push a dangerous route to fame? Or did they truly come into contact with something from another plane of existence? I'll let you decide. But more importantly, I would like to know what you think in the comments below. Also, if you enjoyed today's video, be sure to go ahead and smack that like button. And if you're new to the channel, hit that big old red subscribe button and keep your notifications turned on because I release storytelling of the mysterious and supernatural. As always guys, I love you all, keep an open mind and I'll catch you guys in the next video.